Chapter 18 of Molly Brown's Freshman Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. Molly Brown's Freshman Days by Nell Speed. The Football Game. During those fast flying weeks which tread on one another's heels so rapidly between Thanksgiving and Christmas, came one of the most important events of the season. It was announced on the bulletin board as the Harvard Snail football game, and was, in fact, a grand burlesque on a game played not long before between two university teams. Quite half of the Wellington students took part in the affair, and those who were not actively engaged were placed in the cheer sections to yell themselves hoarse. There were a dozen doctors, an ambulance, stretcher bearers, trained nurses, and the two teams in proper football attire. Everybody in college turned out one Saturday afternoon to witness this elaborate parody. A coach drove over from Exmoor, fairly alive with students, and the fields outside the Wellington Athletic Grounds were black with people. Judy was a member of the Corps of Physicians who were all dressed alike in frock coats reaching well below the knees, gray trousers, and silk hats. They had imposing mustaches, carried bags of instruments, and were the most ludicrous of all the actors that day. But it was the stretcher bearers who seemed to excite the greatest merriment in the grand parade, which took place before the game began. They were dressed something like Slivers, the famous clown, in full white pantaloons and long white coats cut in at the waist with wide skirts. The members of the cheering sections which headed the grand column were dressed in every sort of absurd burlesque of a college boy's clothes that could be devised. How they ever collected all those ridiculous costumes is a marvel to me, exclaimed President Walker to Dr. McLean, whose face had turned an apoplectic purple from laughter, and who occasionally let out a roar of joy that could be heard all the way across the field. Following the cheering sections in the parade were the two teams, hardly recognizable at all as human beings. Their wigs of tousled hair stood out all over their heads like the petals of enormous chrysanthemums. Most of them wore nose guards, or their faces were made up in a savage and barbaric fashion. In their wadded football suits, stuffed out of all human recognition, they resembled trussed fowls. In the vanguard of this strange and ludicrous procession stalked a gigantic figure of liberty. She was about fifteen feet high, and her draperies reached to the ground. Her long red hair blew in the breezes, and she carried a Wellington banner, which she majestically raved over the heads of the multitude. By her side ran a dwarf. They were the mascots of the two sides. Why, if that isn't our little friend, Miss Molly Brown, exclaimed Dr. McLean, pointing to Liberty. She's a bonny lass and a sweet one. Think now of her being able to walk on the sticks without losing her balance. It's a very great achievement, I'm thinking, for a giddy-headed young woman. For they're all giddy-headed at seventeen or thereabouts. It was indeed Molly, the only girl in all Wellington who could walk on stilts. The seniors had advertised in the commune for a first-class stiltswoman, and Molly had promptly offered her services. Jessie had been selected as the dwarf. "'I hope the child won't fall and break her neck,' said Mrs. McLean on the other side of the doctor. "'It's very dangerous. Suppose she should become suddenly faint. Don't suppose anything of the sort, mither. You've no grounds for thinking the lass will tumble. She seems to be at home in the air.' Professor Green, just beyond Mrs. McLean, frowned and put his hands in his pockets. He wondered if Dr. McLean had forgotten that he had been sent for just three weeks before when Molly had fainted in the gymnasium, and the professor breathed a sigh of relief when Liberty presently descended to the earth and the game began. It was one of the bloodiest and roughest games in the history of football. The ambulance bell rang constantly. Every time a victim fell, the cheering section on the other side set up a wild yell. Doctors and nurses were scattered all about the edges of the field, attending to the wounded, and the stretchers were busy every minute. As fast as one man tumbled, another jumped into his place, and at last, when there came a touchdown, the players seemed to have fallen on top of each other in a mad, squirming mass. People laughed that day who were rarely seen to smile. Even Miss Steele's severe expression relaxed into a cold, steely smile. Molly had gathered up her long cheesecloth robe and was sitting with Jessie on a bench at the side of the field. Isn't it perfect, Jessie, she was saying. I don't think I ever enjoyed anything so much in all my life. It will make a wonderful letter home. Jessie smiled absently. 
with a pair of field glasses she was searching the faces of the spectators for two friends men of course who had motored over to see the sport at her belt was pinned the most enormous bunch of violets ever seen in fact they were two bunches worn as one from her two admirers presently judith joined them on the bench ever since the thanksgiving spread she had endeavored to be very nice to molly hello juju called jessie you are a sight i know it she said i feel that i am a disgrace to the sex i only hope i'm not recognizable your shiny black eye is the only familiar thing about you the rest is entirely disguised i think i'd recognize that ring miss blount put in molly almost everybody knows that emerald by sight now who knows you at all judith glanced quickly at her finger do you know she exclaimed i forgot i was wearing it how stupid of me i am booked to take rosamond's place in a minute will one of you girls take care of it for me i shall be much obliged you'd better take it jessie said molly looking rather doubtfully at the ring she had only one piece of jewelry to her name a string of sapphires which had belonged to her mother when she was a girl but the ring was too big for jessie's slender pretty little fingers i can't she said unless i wear it on my thumb and it might slip off you know you'll have to take it molly molly slipped it on her finger and held it up for admiration it's the most beautiful ring i ever saw she exclaimed it's the color of deep green sea-water not that i ever saw any but i've heard tell of it she added laughing you don't mean to say you have never seen the ocean cried judith in a pleasant tone of voice molly had never seen her so amiable before no replied the freshman this is the nearest i have ever been to it well thanks for taking care of my ring went on judith i'll see you after the game and she departed to take up her duties on the field just as rosamond at the appointed time with a gash across her face made with fingernail salve was borne from the field on a stretcher after the game came another grand procession in which all the wounded took part molly on stilts with jessie running beside her as before all that morning molly had felt buoyed up by the fun and excitement of the great burlesque but now that the game was over as she strode along on the giant stilts she began to feel the same overpowering fatigue she had experienced that night at the living picture show for a week she had been living on her nerves often at night she had not slept but had tossed about on her bed trying to recall her lessons or make mental notes of things she intended to do on cold mornings her feet and hands were numb and dead and judy often made her run across the campus and back to start her circulation and now that numbness began to climb from her toes straight up her body molly turned unsteadily and with shaky strides at least six feet long hastened across the field her feeling that she must get out of the noise and turmoil away from everybody in the world carried her back of a row of sheds under which the players sat during the intermissions once in this quiet place she let herself down from the stilts she was conscious of being very cold there was a deep red light in the western sky from the setting sun then the numbness reached her brain and she remembered nothing more until she opened her eyes and saw dr mclean at one side of her and professor green at the other here she comes back at last exclaimed the doctor ay lass it's a good thing this young man has an observant eye otherwise you might have been lying out here in the cold all night you feel better now don't you yes doctor answered molly weakly i don't like these fainting spells my lass you're not made of iron child you'll have to give up one thing or t'other study or play but there were other things molly did besides studying and playing of course the doctor did not know about the cloudbursts and the shoe blacking and the tutoring ay here comes one of my associates with a carriage he went on chuckling to himself shall we have a consultation now dr keen judy still in her absurd burlesque costume had driven up in one of the village surreys as the two men lifted molly into the back seat she noticed for the first time that she was wearing a man's overcoat it was dark blue and felt warm and comfortable she slipped her hands into the deep pockets and snuggled down into its folds certainly she felt shivery about the spine and her hands and feet which were never known to be warm were now like lumps of ice as the doctor was still wearing his great coat of scotch tweed it was evidently the coat of the professor of english literature she had appropriated it's awfully good of you to lend me your coat she said to professor green who was standing at the side of the carriage while the doctor climbed in beside her i'm afraid you'll take cold without it nonsense he said almost gruffly i'm not dressed in cheesecloth but i have on a white sweater under all this said molly timidly 
the carriage drove away however without his saying another word and later that afternoon after molly had taken a nap and felt rested and refreshed she engaged one of the maids at queen's cottage to return professor green's overcoat with a message of thanks then with a sigh of relief because when she had borrowed anything it always weighed heavily on her mind and because she felt somehow the professor was provoked with her she turned over and went to sleep again just as the clock in the chapel tower sounded midnight she sat up in bed what is it molly dear asked nance who was wakeful and uneasy about her friend molly was looking at her right hand wildly the ring she cried judith's emerald ring it's gone the ring was indeed gone neither of her friends had seen it on her finger since she had been in her room it was gone lost it must have slipped off my finger when i fainted sobbed the poor girl nance had summoned judy at this trying crisis and the two girls endeavored to comfort the friend who seemed to be working herself into a state of feverish excitement never mind we'll find it in the morning molly cried nance you know exactly where it was you fell don't you somewhere behind the sheds it's sure to be there judy and i promised to go there first thing don't we judy yes indeed acquiesced judy who loved her morning sleep better than anything in life but judy was learning unselfishness since she had been associating with molly and nance there was no more sleep for poor molly that night however and she lay through the dragging hours with strained nerves and throbbing temples wondering what would happen if she did not find the ring End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of molly brown's freshman days this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by debbie baker robinson molly brown's freshman days by nell speed three friends nance was still sound asleep when molly crept from her bed and dressed herself it was a dismal cold morning a fine snow was falling and she shivered as she tied a scarf around her head threw her long gray eiderdown cape over her shoulders and slipped from the room without waking her friend who was weary after the excitements of the day before across the windswept campus she hastened anxiety lending swiftness to her steps and at last reached the athletic field at the far end snuggled several low wooden sheds like a group of animals trying to keep warm by staying close together i must hurry molly thought or the snow will be so thick i shall never be able to find the ring and summoning all her energy she ran as fast as she could straight to the spot where she remembered to have dropped the day before behind the sheds breathless and tingling all over with little prickly chills she knelt down and began to search in the dead grass brushing the snow away as she hunted she had not stopped to find gloves neither had she wasted any time lacing her boots but had slipped on some pumps at the side of the bed. For a long time, Molly searched every inch of the ground back of the sheds where she might have been. Then, with an ever-growing feeling of desperation, she hunted in the field itself across which she had followed the parade. And it was here that Judy and Nance found her so absorbed in her search that she had not even noticed their approach. "'Oh, Molly, Molly, what are we going to do with you?' cried Nance, seizing her by the arm impulsively. You'll kill yourself by your imprudence. Why didn't you wait and let us look? Molly opened her mouth to answer, and the words came out in a husky whisper. She had entirely lost her voice from hoarseness, without even knowing that she had caught cold. I've looked everywhere, she whispered, and I haven't found it. I couldn't have lost it while I was on the stilts, because I never let go of them for a moment. It must have been when I fainted. Judy, you take her home while I look again, volunteered Nance. Take her to the infirmary, you mean, answered Judy, and she promptly led Molly by a shortcut toward the last house on the far side of the campus where stood the small college hospital. Molly obediently allowed herself to be piloted along. Her cheeks were burning. There was a feverish light in her eyes, and she no longer felt cold at all, but hot all over with little chills along her spine. I'm afraid I'm a great nuisance, Judy, dear. I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm really in great trouble, she said huskily, as Judy confided her to one of the two nurses at the hospital. Don't worry, was Judy's parting command. We'll find the ring. It can't possibly be lost utterly. It's too big and green. I'll see Judith Blount, too. Someone may have found it and returned it to her by this time. 
I'll leave a notice on the bulletin board and stand my little St. Joseph on his head, she added, laughing. You may be sure I'll leave nothing undone to find that old ring. The first thing Judy did after breakfast that Sunday morning was to pay a visit to Judith Blount. There was a placard on her door announcing to whom it might concern that Judith was busy and did not wish to be disturbed. But Judy knocked boldly and at an impatient, Who is it? replied, I wish to see you on important business. Please unlock the door. Judy couldn't make out why Judith Blount looked so white and uneasy when she entered the room, nor why her expression changed to one of intense relief a moment later. I came to ask you, began Judy abruptly, if anyone had found your emerald ring. Miss Brown has my ring, answered Judith promptly. Didn't you know that Molly had fainted and is now ill in the hospital and the ring is lost? My emerald ring lost? Judith almost shouted. Don't carry on so about it, put in Judy. It'll be found. Molly herself was up at dawn this morning. She stole away before anybody could stop her and went to the field to look for it, but she hasn't been able to find it, and neither has Nance, who looked for it later. Nance has gone down to the village to find the surrey that took Molly home. We are all doing everything we can, and in the meantime I thought I would tell you so that you could help us. Judy could be very impudent when she wanted to, and she was impudent now as she stood looking straight into Judith's angry black eyes. She should have been more careful, burst out Judith in a rage. How do I know that? She stopped, frightened at what she was about to say. Better not say that, said Judy calmly. It simply wouldn't go, you know, and you must know as well as I do that it would be absolutely false. How do you know what I was going to say? I could guess, said Judy, shrugging her shoulders. I can often guess things you would like to say, but don't, Miss Blount. What I came for was to ask you to help us find the ring. Molly is very ill, and, of course, it's the loss of the ring as much as anything else that's made her so. We're all doing the best we can, and if you'll just kindly add your effort to ours, it might help some. Supposing the ring isn't found, what redress have I? It's been in our family for generations. It was brought over from France by a Huguenot ancestor. Nice place to be wearing it, then, at a football game, exclaimed Judy indignantly and then forcing other people to take charge of it for you? Redress indeed? Do you want Molly to pay you for your ring? I tell you, Miss Plount, that a person who really had Huguenot ancestors would never have suggested such a thing. It wouldn't have been Huguenot etiquette. And Judy flung herself out of the room and down the steps before the astonished Judith had time to realize that she had been insulted by an upstart of a freshman. It looked very much for a day or two as if Molly were going to have a congestion in one lung. For several days she was a very sick girl. She had a strange delirium that she was looking for something while she was walking on stilts. Many times she asked the nurse if sapphires were as valuable as emeralds, and once she demanded to know if an emerald as large as her little fingernail was worth much money, say, two acres of good orchard land. But the lung was not congested as Dr. McLean had at first thought. In a day or two, the fever subsided, and by Thursday she was able to sit up in bed, propped by many pillows, and see Judy and Nance. Her room was a bower of flowers. They had even come from Exmoor, Lawrence Upton having sent her a box of lovely pink roses. Mrs. McLean had brought her a bunch of red berries from the woods, and one day two cards were brought up, one of which looked familiar. Miss Grace Green and Mr. Edwin Green, inquiring as to the improvement in Miss Molly Brown's condition, were pleased to hear that she was better. And now Nance and Judy sat on either side the young invalid, each trying to assume a cheerful expression and each feeling that whatever disagreeable things had happened, and several had happened, they must be hidden from Molly at all costs. Judith Blount had scattered reports around college of an extremely hateful character which Molly's friends had done their best to suppress. The ring had never been found, although everything had been done that could be thought of in the way of advertising and searching. Moreover, Miss Steele had asked twice of Molly's condition in a very meaning tone of voice, and had wished to know exactly when the nurse thought Molly would be able to see visitors. These things the girls knew, and since Molly was still weak and very hoarse, her friends were careful to keep off dangerous subjects. Strange to say, Molly had never mentioned the ring to anyone since she had been in the hospital. Everybody has been so beautifully kind, she was saying, and really I think the rest is going to do me so much good 
that when I get well, I'll be better than I was before I got sick, she added, laughing. We've missed you terribly, said Nance dolefully. Queen's just a dead old hole without you, Molly, dear, went on Judy affectionately. Molly smiled lovingly at her two friends. You are the dearest, she began, taking a hand of each when the nurse entered. Miss Stewart would like to see you, Miss Brown. Oh, yes, cried Molly. Do ask her to come up. Nance and Judy did not linger after Mary Stewart's arrival. Her face also wore a serious look, and she took Molly's hand and gazed down into her face almost with a compassionate expression. How are you, Molly, dear? Oh, I'm much better, replied Molly cheerfully. I shall be up by tomorrow, the doctor says, and I expect to go back to Queen's Sunday. Mary sat down and drew her chair up close to the little white bed. It's almost providential my being in the hospital like this, went on Molly. It's rested me so. You see, I was terribly worried about something when I came here. And you aren't worried any longer? No, I've conquered it. I know it's got to be faced, but I believe there will be a way out of it, and I'm not frightened any more. I have always had a kind of blind faith like that when things look very black. You are talking of the emerald ring, aren't you, Molly? Yes, Mary. I know it hasn't been found, of course. I can tell that by the girls' faces, and I know that Judith Bount is... Well, she is your friend, Mary. Oh, no, not now, put in Mary. We've had a, er, a difference of opinion that has, uh, well, not to put too fine a point on it, broken up our friendship. I always admired her without ever really liking her. Molly looked at Mary, and a very tender expression came into her heavenly blue eyes. Was the difference about me? she asked presently. Mary hesitated. Yes, Molly, since she forced me to tell you, it was. She has been saying some horrid things. Of course, I knew she would. I was prepared for that. And I could tell. Molly paused. No, no, I mustn't, she exclaimed hastily. What could you tell, Molly? Don't ask me. I would never speak to myself again if I did tell. She has been saying that I never lost the ring, that I was poor and needed the money, and things like that. Tell me honestly, isn't that the truth? Mary nodded her head and frowned. There was a silence, and presently Mary's strong brown fingers closed over Molly's slender ones. Molly, she began in a business-like tone of voice, I'm almost glad that this subject has come up, because I came here really to... She broke off. It's very hard, she began again. I hardly know how to put it. You knew, Molly, dear, that I was rich, didn't you? Why, yes, I guessed you must be, although you have been careful not to mention it yourself. You're the most high-bred, finest girl I ever knew, Mary, she added impetuously. Mary laughed. That's nice of you to say such things, dear, because I haven't but one ancestor on my paternal side, and that's father. But he's generations in himself. He's so splendid. But to go on, Molly, dear, I am rich. Not ordinarily rich, but enormously, vastly rich. It's absurd, really, because we'll never spend it, and we don't care a rap about saving it. But whatever father touches just turns to gold. I wish he'd touched something for me, laughed Molly wistfully. Now listen to me, dear, and don't interrupt. Father adores me to that extent that I could spend any amount of money, and he would just smile and say, Go ahead, little Mary, go as far as you like. But, you see, I only want a few very nice things. Consequently, I can't be extravagant to save my life. Molly laughed aloud at this naive confession. The point I'm coming to is this, Molly. Judith Blount is being exceedingly horrid over that ring. I believe myself it will be found eventually. But until it is found, I want you... Now, don't interrupt me and don't carry on, please. I want you to ask her the value of her old ring and give her the money for it. If she chooses to be ill-bred, she must be treated with ill-bred methods. But, dearest Mary, I can't, began Molly. Yes, you can. I haven't known you but a few months, Molly, but I've learned to love you in that time. And when I really care for anyone, which is seldom, she becomes a sister to me. You are my little sister and shall always be. I shall never change. And between sisters, there must be no foolish pride. Now, Molly, I want to settle this thing with Judith Blount once and for all, through you, of course. She is not to know I had anything to do with it. You must tell her that you have raised the money and would like to pay her the full value of the ring. When the ring is found, she can give you back the money. That will stop her wicked wagging tongue, at least. Molly tried hard not to cry, but the tears welled up in her eyes and trickled down her cheeks. 
She took Mary's hand and kissed it. I wish I could kiss you, dearest Mary, she sobbed. But you see, I've got such a bad cold. How could she thank Mary for her generous offer, or explain that her family would never allow her to accept the money, even if she felt she could herself? You are the finest, noblest, most generous girl, she went on brokenly. No, I'm not, said Mary. It's easy to do things for people we love, and easier still when we have the money to do it with. If I hadn't been so fond of you, Molly, and had been obliged to deny myself besides, that would have been generosity. This is only a pleasure, a sort of self-gratification, because I've adopted you, you see, as my little sister. Molly lay quietly for a while, with her cheek pressed against Mary's hand. Are you thinking it over? asked Mary at last, patting her cheek. I'm thinking how happy I am, answered Molly. As soon as you are well, then, went on Mary, rising to go, you must have an interview with Judith and settle the whole thing. Molly smiled up at her friend and squeezed her hand. There are times when two friends need not speak to express what they think. Even if I never win the three golden apples, she reflected after Mary had gone, I have won three friends that are as true as gold. End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of Molly Brown's Freshman Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. Molly Brown's Freshman Days by Nell Speed. Miss Steele. With the wonderful powers of recuperation which natures like Molly's have, on Sunday morning she was up and dressed, almost dancing about her room in the infirmary long before it was time for Dr. McLean to call and grant her permission to leave. It was good to be up and well again. It was good to be at college, for she had been homesick for Wellington since she had been shut up in the hospital, and better still, it was good to have friends, such friends as she had. As for the emerald ring, a shadow darkened her face. The thought of the emerald ring would push its way into her mind. I believe it will come out all right, she said to herself. I believe it. I believe it. I couldn't help losing it, and if it isn't found, I can't help that either. I just won't be miserable, that's all. I feel too happy and too well. Are you at home to visitors this morning, Miss Brown? asked a sharp, unmusical voice at the door. Oh, yes, do come in, answered Molly, rising to meet Miss Steele, who had walked up the uncarpeted steps and along the echoing corridor without making a sound as usual. Molly's manners were unfailingly cordial to visitors, and when she shook hands with Miss Steele and insisted on making her take the armchair, that flint-like person visibly softened a little and faintly smiled. Molly wondered why the sanitary inspector had called on her, but she appreciated attentions from anybody and was as grateful for being popular as if it were something entirely new and strange to her. She showed Miss Steele her flowers and pinned a lovely pink rose on the inspector's granite-colored cloth coat. She made light of her illness and rejoiced that she was returning in a few hours to dear old Queen's. She was, in fact, so wonderfully sweet and charming that Sunday morning that it must have been very difficult even for the stony inspector to touch on the real business of her visit. At last, however, Miss Steele buckled on her armor of decision, averted her eyes for a moment from Molly's glowing face, and plunged in. I don't suppose, Miss Brown, you suspected my title of dormitory inspector here was merely a nominal one, and that I had another motive in being at Wellington College? Molly hardly liked to tell her that they had long considered her a spy and detested her for that reason. She said nothing, therefore, and sat in her favorite position when listening intently with her hands clasping one knee and her shoulders drooping, a very wrong position indeed, considering that it would eventually make her round-shouldered and hollow-chested but Molly was never more graceful or comfortable than when she adopted this unhealthful attitude. I am an inspector, went on the other, but I am an inspector of police, that is, a detective. Doubtless you have heard of certain mysterious things that have happened at Wellington this autumn, the attempt to burn the gymnasium, which we now believe was only a practical joke to frighten the sophomore class, the cutting of the electric wires one night, and there are a few other things you have not heard, for instance, Miss Walker has received lately several anonymous letters, two of them about you. 
Molly started. About me, she exclaimed. Yes, said Miss Steele, watching her closely. But they were not disagreeable letters, strange to say, since anonymous letters usually are. They expressed the most ardent admiration for you. They mentioned that you had enemies who were trying to ruin your reputation. How absurd, exclaimed Molly indignantly. She detested anything deceitful and underhand with all her soul. When did these letters come? Just since you have been at the infirmary. They must be about the emerald ring, broke in Molly. Exactly, answered the inspector. You have lost a valuable emerald ring belonging to another girl who was making it disagreeable for you. But I didn't want to take care of her ring, protested Molly. She insisted on it. It was too big for my finger, and when I fainted, it must have slipped off. I've done everything I could to find it, but she needn't worry. She'll be paid for it if two acres of good apple orchard that were to have paid my college expenses have to go. Nonsense, child, exclaimed Miss Steele, suddenly melting into a human being. I'm going to find that ring for you if it takes the rest of this winter. Molly seized her hand joyfully. By one of those swift flashes of insight which come to us when we least expect them, it was revealed to Molly that she had made a friend of the inspector. I have been here almost a month, continued Miss Steele, giving the girl's hand a little vice-like squeeze, which was her way of expressing cordiality. And I have found out a great many things. A girl's college is a strange place. There is a good deal of wire-pulling and petty jealousy among a certain class of girls, and yet I have reason to know that the code of honor here is exceedingly high, and I find myself growing more and more interested in the girls and their lives. Nowhere but in college could such devoted friendships be formed. They are elevating and fine, especially for selfish girls who learn how to be unselfish by example. The girls develop each other. Your GF Society, for instance, has had a remarkably refining and, shall I say, quieting effect on Miss Andrews. Molly started. She was amazed at the inspector's insight into the college life. Which brings me to the point I have been aiming to reach. Since I have been here, I have taken pains to learn the history of Miss Andrews as well as to study her character. She is a strange girl. Doubtless you know the incident of last year? Molly shook her head. To begin at the beginning, Miss Andrews' parents were rather strange people. Her father is a city politician who never made any secret of his grafting methods. Her mother was an actress and is dead. Frances hadn't been brought up to any code of honor. She had been allowed to do as she chose and had all the money she wanted to spend. If she is vulgar and pretentious, it isn't really her fault. Last year, she offended her class by telling a falsehood. She was under honor, according to the custom here when a student leaves the premises, to be back from some visit by ten o'clock Sunday night. She missed the ten o'clock train and took the train which arrived at midnight. However, as luck would have it, the ten o'clock train was delayed by a washout and drew into Wellington Station just in front of the train Frances was on. She, of course, found this out immediately, and, taking advantage of it, she gave out that she had been on the earlier train, which saved all unnecessary explanations. It must have been a great temptation for a girl brought up as she had been. But truth always comes to the top sooner or later, and as the president of her own class happened to have been on the earlier train, she was found out. She was summoned by the student council, tried, and found guilty. Then she was treated, I imagine, something in the same way that a French soldier is expelled from the army. Figuratively speaking, her sword was broken and her epaulets torn from her uniform. How terrible, exclaimed Molly. Yes, it was pretty severe, but she was very defiant and said dreadful things, denounced her class and college. Few girls would have had the courage to return to college next year, but she came back hoping to live her dishonor down and when she found her class to a member ignored her very existence, she became almost insane with bitterness and rage, and having studied her character closely, I judged that for a while, until your secret society took her in hand, she was hardly responsible for her actions. Now, Miss Walker is very sorry for Frances Andrews, but she considers her a dangerous element in college, and at mid-years she would like some definite reason for asking her not to come back. I am speaking plainly because Miss Walker is convinced that you know a definite reason and through some mistaken idea of kindness, you keep it to yourself. In fact, Miss Brown, Miss Walker is convinced that you and you alone saw Frances Andrews cut the wires in the gymnasium that night. But I didn't, cried Molly, much excited. 
or rather it wasn't miss andrews miss steele looked at her in surprise so sure was she that molly would confirm her suspicions molly sat down again and clasped her knees with her long arms her cheeks were crimson and her eyes blazing who was it then asked the inspector i can't tell you that miss steele if i should give you the girl's name i should be dishonored all my life i have been brought up to believe that the one who tells is as low as the one who did the deed when we were children my mother would never listen to a tell-tale i do think it was a wicked mischievous thing to have done a contemptible thing but i'd rather you found out the name of the girl in some other way than through me especially right now why right now but molly would not reply miss steele could see nothing but truth in the depths of molly's troubled blue eyes she took the girl's hand in hers and looked at her gravely you are a fine girl miss brown she said and if you tell me that the girl who cut the wires was not miss andrews i believe you implicitly of course miss walker would never tell miss andrews not to return to wellington without something very definite and tangible on which to base her dismissal luke andrews the girl's father is as hot-headed and high-tempered as his daughter and he would probably make a great deal of trouble and cause a great deal of publicity if francis were asked to leave the college quietly i'm sorry for her said molly i think she might have been helped if she had had just a little more time after all the worst thing about her is her bringing up and this other girl whom you are shielding miss brown does she deserve so much generosity from you molly closed her lips firmly that isn't the question with me miss steele she said at last the question is could i ever show my face again if i told but no one need ever know that is no one but the president and me you don't understand said molly wearily it's with me you see i could never be on comfortable terms with myself again i should always be thinking that i hadn't behaved well like a gentleman then the inspector did a most surprising thing she went over and kissed molly i wouldn't for worlds keep you from being true to yourself my child she exclaimed it's a rare quality and one which will make you devoted friends all your life because people will always know they can trust you molly looked at the inspector and lo and behold a strange transformation had taken place in that inscrutable expressionless face the cold gray eyes were softened by a mist of tears and the thin lips were actually quivering she looked almost beautiful at that moment and molly suddenly put her arms around her neck and laid her head on the flat hard chest you'll forgive me won't you miss steele i will indeed dear answered the other patting molly's cheek and now don't bother about all this business get well and strong don't overwork and i promise to find that ring for you if i have to turn the college upside down to do it then she gave molly a warm motherly squeeze kissed her on the forehead and took her departure as quietly as she had come end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of molly brown's freshman days this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. Molly Brown's Freshman Days by Nell Speed. A Bachelor's Pocket. Miss Steele was a very busy woman that afternoon. She was shut up with Judy Kane for half an hour. She visited the livery stable in the village. She paid a call on Dr. McLean, and finally she went to see Professor Green it is in professor green's study on the cloisters that we now find her sitting bolt upright in her chair alert and bright-eyed at such times as this miss steele is not unlike a hunting dog on the scent of his quarry professor green sits at his desk he looks tired and his heavy reddish eyebrows are drawn together in a frown when the inspector came into the room he had pushed a pile of manuscript under some loose papers but a sheet had slipped off and now lay in plain view across it was written in a bold hand exunt fairies in disorder leaving wood sprite at left center the song of the wood sprite i hope you will pardon this intrusion professor i see you are very busy the inspector began glancing at the manuscript with a look of some slight amusement the professor hastily covered up the sheet not at all he said politely i'm just idling away a little time 
What can I do for you? He had seen Miss Steele about the building, and most of the faculty knew her by this time as inspector of dormitories. Do you remember helping a young lady who fainted on the day of the football game? Oh, yes, certainly, replied the professor, absent-mindedly fingering a paper cutter. You lent her your overcoat that afternoon, didn't you? Why, yes, I believe I did. Have you worn the coat since? Certainly, he answered, laughing. Every day and several times a day. It's the only one I have. Are you a detective? Yes. Do you ever put things in the pockets of your coat? The professor smiled shamefacedly like a schoolboy culprit. In one of them, there's been a hole in the other one for a long time, two years at least. Would you mind letting me see that coat? He lifted the blue overcoat from a hook on the door and placed it on a chair beside Miss Steele. Am I a suspect? he asked politely. Has anything been lost? The detective seized the overcoat and began rummaging through the pockets with a practiced hand. Yes, she answered, something has been lost, and extremely disagreeable things have been said by the owner about it. About me? asked the professor, still groping in the dark. No, no, about the girl who lost it. Miss Brown? The detective did not reply. She had run her hand through the hole in the pocket and was now searching the corners between the lining and the cloth. Ha! she cried at last, exactly like the detective in a play. Here it is! With a swift movement, she extricated her hand from the bottomless pocket and displayed between her thumb and forefinger a large emerald ring. Why, that's the ring of my cousin Judith Blount, exclaimed the professor in amazement. And I have had it in my pocket all this time. Great heavens! What an extraordinary thing! And how did it get there? Miss Blount forced Miss Brown to take charge of it while she was playing football. After Miss Brown came to from her faint, she must have been very cold and slipped her hands in the pockets of this coat for warmth. She did, confirmed the professor, and the ring slipped off. When she found it was lost, she got up at dawn next day and went out in her slippers in the snow to find it and nearly caught her death. But she's had no thanks for her trouble from your relation, I can assure you. Nothing but abuse. What? shouted the professor. You mean to say that Judith has dared to insinuate... She has, said Miss Steele. And she whom Miss Brown has shielded? Great heavens, this is too much. He began walking up and down the room in a rage. Shielded from what? I am not at liberty to tell you, he replied. The girl repented of what she did. I know that, but she's an ungrateful little wretch. A scholarly professor of English literature, however, is no match for a well-trained detective, and with a knowing smile on her lips, the inspector rose to leave. You may return the ring, she said. It will be a great relief to Miss Molly Brown of Kentucky to know it has been found. She was about to give up two acres of good apple orchard to pay for it, the land, in fact, which was to provide the money for her college expenses. And with that, she sailed out of the room and went straight to the home of President Walker, with whom she spent the better part of an hour. Professor Green followed close on her heels. He did not pause at Miss Walker's pretty stucco residence, however, but hastened down the campus and rang the bell at Queen's Cottage. Miss Brown was in, he learned from the maid. She had only arrived from the infirmary that afternoon. The professor waited in the sitting room, deserted by the students at that hour, those who were not studying in their rooms being at Vespers. Presently, Molly appeared, looking very slender and tall, like a pale flower swaying on its stalk. The professor rushed up and seized her hand unceremoniously. My dear child, he cried, how am I ever going to make my apologies to you for all this trouble of which I have been the unconscious cause? For what? began Molly, too much astonished to finish her question. The ring! The ring! It's been concealed in the ragged lining of my shabby old overcoat all this time, and that clever detective of dormitories, or whatever she is, ferreted it out just now. Perhaps I should have thought of it myself, but you see, I hadn't even heard the ring had been lost. I am afraid you suffered a great deal. I did at first, but after I grew better, I never let myself slip back into that state again. I kept believing it would be found. I was so sure of it that I haven't really been unhappy at all. You see, everybody is so beautifully kind, and no one believed. Great heavens, interrupted the professor, storming excitedly around the room. That ungrateful, wicked girl to have made such an accusation. She shall hear from me what she owes to you. I'll take the ring to her myself later. She is my cousin, and her brother is as near to me as my own brother, but... You aren't going to tell Prexy, cried Molly. I must. Besides, I nearly gave it away to Miss Steele. Oh, well, if that's the case, she knows already. She's a detective, and if you let two words slip, she can easily guess the rest. 
There's no keeping anything from her. You may be sure Prexy knows it by this time. I'm rather relieved, said the professor. Judith will probably be well punished, but she should be. I've always wondered, said Molly after a short pause, why Judith did it. The professor looked at her closely with his humorous brown eyes. Have you no idea why? he asked. Except for mischief and to annoy the seniors, she answered. Possibly, he said. A girl who has been spoiled and petted as she has will give in to almost any whim that seizes her. However, such actions are not tolerated at Wellington, and she will have to learn a few pretty stiff lessons if she expects to remain here. Then Professor Green shook hands with Molly, gave her a little paternal advice about taking care of her health, and took his departure. His next destination was the President's house, where he waited in the drawing room until Miss Steele had terminated her interview. He was prepared for a round scolding from his old friend who had known him since his early youth, but the President was inclined to be lenient with the young man. It all goes to show, she said at the end of the interview, that murder will out. But why did the foolish girl do that mischievous thing? What does she have to gain by it? He shrugged his shoulders. Jealous of someone prettier and more popular than herself, probably, he answered. The president sighed. Who can understand the intricacies of a young girl's heart, she said. I have been studying them for twenty years, and they are still a closed book to me. When Professor Green a little later returned the emerald ring to his cousin, he cut the visit as short as possible. He told her that she had deliberately and wrongfully accused one who had shielded her even at the risk of offending the president of Wellington College, and that it was he who had given the detective, already suspicious, the clue she wanted. Judith wept bitterly, but her cousin showed no signs of relenting. If you want to be loved, he said, learn unselfishness and gentleness and truthfulness. These are the qualities that make men and women beloved. You will never gain anything by cheating and lying. The end of the episode was a pretty severe punishment for Judith Blount. She was suspended from college for three weeks and was compelled to resign from all societies for the rest of the winter. She left college next morning early and no one saw her again until after Christmas when she returned a much chastened and quieted young woman. A few days after she had gone, Molly received a note from her from New York. It read, Dear Miss Brown, will you forgive me? I am very unhappy. Judith Blount. You may be sure that Molly's reply was prompt and forgiving. End of chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of Molly Brown's Freshman Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. Molly Brown's Freshman Days by Nell Speed. Christmas, Mid Years, and the Wanderthirst. There are few lonelier and more dismal experiences in life than Christmas away from home for the first time. Molly felt her heart sink as the great day approached. One morning, a trainload of chattering, laughing girls pulled out of the Wellington station. Judy, hanging recklessly to the last step, waved her handkerchief until Molly's figure grew indistinct in the distance, and Nance on the crowded platform called out again and again, Goodbye, Molly, dear. Goodbye. Molly almost regretted that she had ever left Kentucky as the Christmas train became a point of black on the horizon. I might have ended my days as a teacher in a country schoolhouse and been happier than this, she thought desperately, starting back to college. Someone came running up behind her. It was Mary Stewart who had been down to see some classmates off. She was to take the night train to New York. When do you get off, she asked, slipping her arm through Molly's like the good comrade she was. I'm surprised you didn't leave yesterday with such a long journey before you. I'm not going home this Christmas, replied Molly. Not going, began Mary. You're to be left at Queen's by yourself? Molly nodded, vainly endeavoring to smile cheerfully. Then you're to go with me. I'll come right along now and help you pack, announced Mary decisively. But Mary, I can't. I haven't anything, money or clothes. Don't say but to me. I've got everything. I've even got the drawing room to myself on the night train to New York. You shall go with me. I don't know why I never thought of it before. We'll have a beautiful Christmas together. 
since mother's death five years ago christmas has been a dismal time at our house you'll be just the person to cheer us up it will be like having a child in the house you shall have a christmas tree and hang up your stocking father will be delighted and so will brother willie thus overruled molly was borne triumphantly to new york that same evening and spent one of the most wonderful christmases of her life in mary's beautiful home on riverside drive as her mother and godmother both wisely sent her checks for christmas gifts she was not embarrassed by any lack of ready money she was even rich enough to purchase a new evening dress and a pretty blouse which mary had ordered to be sent up on approval and not for many a year afterward did she guess why those charming things happened to be such bargains but molly was a very inexperienced young person and knew little concerning prices at that time mary's father was a fine man quiet and self-contained with a splendid rugged face he treated his only daughter with indescribable tenderness and called her little mary they did not see much of brother willie a sophomore at yale and very busy enjoying his holiday he regarded molly as a child and his sister as an old maid but condescended to take them to the theater twice but all good things must come to an end and it seemed just a little while before molly found herself back at her old desk in her room at queen's writing a bread-and-butter letter to mr stewart which pleased him mightily since mary's guests had never before taken that trouble judy came back radiantly happy she had had a glorious time in washington with her vagabond parents as she called them nance too had enjoyed her christmas with her father and busy mother who had come home to rest during the holidays only one of queen's girls did not join the jolly circle that now congregated in the most hospitable room in the house to swap holiday experiences but a letter had arrived from the missing member addressed to miss m c w brown and beginning my dear molly brown good-bye the letter ran i'm off for europe and grandmamma by the kismet sailing the eighteenth i am afraid i was too much like a bull in a china shop at college i was always breaking something mostly rules i've done lots of foolish things and i am sorry they were jokes of course most of them and intended to frighten silly self-important people i've learned a great deal from you and your friends but i'd rather practice my new wisdom on other people if you ever see me again you'll find me changed i may enter a convent for a few years in france and learn to keep quiet you did what you could for me and so did the others you are a first-rate lot and you make a jolly good freshman class i shall miss you and i shall miss old wellington i wouldn't have come back this year if i hadn't felt the call of its two gray towers somehow it's been more of a home to me than most places and when i'm quite old and forgotten i shall go back and see it again some day good-bye again and good luck i've told mrs murphy to give you my persian prayer rug it's just your color of blue f andrews molly read the letter aloud and the girls were half sorry and half relieved over its contents after all francis was a very disturbing element but as margaret wakefield announced later at a meeting of the g f society she had responded to kind treatment and she margaret moved that they sent her a combination steamer letter of farewell and a bunch of violets to cheer her on her lonely voyage the movement was promptly seconded by molly carried by universal acclaim and the resolution put into effect immediately after christmas comes the terror of every freshman's heart the mid-year examinations as the dreaded week approached lights burned late in every house on the campus and nobody offered any interference behind closed doors sat scores of weary maidens with pale concentrated faces bent over textbooks judy keen made a record at queen's she crammed history for thirty-six hours at a stretch only stopping for food occasionally or to snatch a half hour's nap it was saturday and bitter cold examinations were to begin on monday and there yet remained two more blessed days of respite molly in a long gray dressing gown with a towel wrapped around her head had been cramming mathematics since six in the morning and now at eleven o'clock she lifted her eyes from the hated volume and looked about her with a dazed expression as if she had suddenly awakened from a black dream nance had hurried into the room molly for heaven's sakes go to judy i think she's losing her mind she is overstudied and it has affected her brain i can't do anything with her at all what 
cried molly rushing down the hall her long gray wrapper trailing after her in voluminous folds she opened judy's door unceremoniously and marched in the room looked as if a cyclone had struck it the contents of the bureau drawers were dumped onto the floor the closet was emptied clothes and books piled about on the bed and chairs and judy's two trunks filled up what floor space remained judy herself was working feverishly she had packed a layer of books in one of the trunks and was now folding up her best dresses julia keene what are you doing cried molly in a stern voice judy gave her a constrained nod don't bother me now there's a dear i'm in a dreadful hurry molly shook her violently by the shoulder she had a feeling that judy was asleep and must be waked up get up from there this minute and answer my question she commanded what was your question asked judy with an embarrassed little laugh oh yes you asked what i was doing i should think you could see i wasn't gathering cowslips on the campus are you running away judy asked molly trying another tack yes my mariucci cried judy quoting a popular song i'm going to pack on my trunk and take my monk and sail for sunny italy molly refused even to smile at this witticism i know what you're doing she exclaimed you are running away from examinations you're a coward you are no better than a deserter from the army in time of war it's bad enough in time of peace but just before the battle i'm so ashamed and disappointed in you that i can hardly understand how i ever could have loved you so much judy went on stolidly packing rolling her clothes into little bundles and stuffing them in anywhere she could find a place between her numerous books have you lost your nerve judy dear said molly after a minute kneeling down beside her friend and seizing her hands i suppose so said judy extricating her hands and speaking in a hard strained voice in an effort to keep from breaking down i'd rather not stay here and be disgraced by flunking but there's another reason beside that molly i know i look like a deserter and deserve to be shot but there's another reason she wailed there's another good reason why judy dearest what can it be asked molly gently they're going to italy she burst out they're sailing on monday i got the letter today and oh i can't stand it i can't endure it they'll be in sicily in a few weeks and without me mamma hates the cold so do i i'm numb now with it oh molly they'll be sailing without me and i want to go you can't understand what the feeling is there is something in me that is calling all the time and i can't help hearing it and answering in my mind i can live through every bit of the voyage at first it's cold bitter cold and then after a few days we get into the gulf stream and gradually it grows warmer even in the winter time the air is soft and smells of the south at last the azores come cunning little islands snuggling down out there in the atlantic and finally you see a long line of coast it's africa then gibraltar and the mediterranean oh molly and algiers lovely algiers nestling down between the hills and looking across such a harbor you can see the domes of the mosques as you sail in and arab boys come out in funny little boats and offer to row you to shore it's delightfully warm and you smell flowers everywhere the sky is a deep blue it's like june and then after algiers comes italy judy had risen to her feet now and her eyes had an uncanny expression in them she appeared to have lost sight entirely of the little room at queen's and through the chaos of books and clothing she was seeing a vision of the south come back to earth judy said molly gently pulling her sleeve wouldn't your mother and father be angry with you for giving up college and joining them uninvited angry cried judy of course not even if i just caught the steamer it would be all right they would fix it up somehow and they would be glad oh so glad what a glorious time we will have together perhaps we shall spend a few weeks in capri i shall try and make them stay a while in capri such a view there is at capri across the bay papa loves naples he even loves its dirtiness and calls it local color we'll have to stay there a week to satisfy him and then mamma will make us go to ravello she's mad about it and then i'll have my choice it's venice of course but we'll wait until it's warmer for venice april is perfect there and then rome after easter oh molly molly help me pack i'm off 
I'm off. Isn't it glorious? Italy, when the spring begins, the roses and the violets and the freesias. Judy began running about the room, snatching her things from the bed and chairs and tossing them into the trunks helter-skelter. Molly watched her in silence for a while. She must collect her ideas and think of something to say. But not now. It was like arguing with a lunatic to say anything now. At last, Judy's feverish energy burned itself out, and she sat down on the bed exhausted. So, you're going to give up four splendid years at college and all the friends you've made, Nance and me and Margaret and Jessie and nice old Sally Marks and Mabel, all the fun and the jolly times, the delightful glorious life we have here, and for what? For a three months trip you have taken before, and will take again often, no doubt just for three short, paltry little months' pleasure, you're going to give up things that will be precious to you for the rest of your life. It's not only the book learning, it's the association and the friends. I don't see why I should lose my friends, broke in Judy sullenly. They'll never be the same again. They couldn't after such a disappointment as this. You see, you'll always be remembered as a coward who turned and ran when examinations came. You lost your nerve and dropped out, and even pretty little Jessie has the courage to face it. Oh, Judy, but I'm disappointed in you. It's a hard blow to come now when we're all fighting to save ourselves and pull through safely. And you, one of the cleverest and brightest girls in the class. Don't tell me your father will be pleased. He'll be mortified. I'm certain of it. He's much too fine a man to admire a cowardly act, no matter whose act it is. You'll see. He'll be shocked and hurt. If he had thought it was right for you to give up college on the eve of examinations, he would have written for you to come. It will be a crushing blow to him, Judy. Judy lay on her bed, her hands clasped back of her head. There was a defiant look on her face, and she kicked the quilt up and down with one foot like an impatient horse pawing the ground. Then suddenly she collapsed like a pricked balloon. Burying her face in the pillows, she began sobbing bitterly, her body shaking convulsively with every sob. It was a terrible sight to see Judy cry, and Molly hoped she would be spared such another experience. Without saying another word, Molly began quietly unpacking the trunks and putting the things back in their places. Then she pulled the empty trunks into the hall. This done, she filled a basin with water, recklessly poured in an ample quantity of Judy's German cologne, and sitting on the side of the bed, began bathing her friend's convulsed and swollen face. Gradually, Judy's sobs subsided. Her weary eyelids drooped, and presently she dropped off into a deep, exhausted sleep. Nance crept into the room. She's all right now, whispered Molly. She's had an attack of the wanderthirst but it's past. All day and all night Judy slept, and on Sunday morning she was her old self once more, gay and laughing and full of fun. That afternoon she was an usher at Vespers in Wellington Chapel with Molly and Nance, and wore her best suit and a big black velvet hat. She never alluded again to her attack of wonderthirst, but her devotion to Molly deepened and strengthened as the days flew by until it became as real to her as her love for her mother and father. Once in the midst of the dreaded examinations, they did not seem so dreadful after all. The girls at Queen's came out of the fight with some wounds but still breathing, as Margaret Wakefield had put it. Molly had a condition in mathematics. I got it because I expected it, she said. But Judy came through with flying colors, not a single black mark against her. Jessie barely pulled through, and her friends rejoiced that the prettiest, most frivolous member of the freshman class had made such a valiant fight and won. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of Molly Brown's Freshman Days This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. Molly Brown's Freshman Days by Nell Speed. Sophomores at last. Freshmen arise, gird on thy sword. Captivity is o'er. To arms, to arms, for lo thou art, a daring sophomore. 
the words of this stirring song floated in through the open windows at queen's one warm night in early june moonlight flooded the campus and the air was sweet with the perfume of lilac and syringa a group of sophomores had gathered in front of the house to serenade the freshmen at queen's who had immediately repaired to the piazza to acknowledge this unusual honor paid them by their august predecessors i think it would be far more appropriate if they sang when all the saints who from their labors rest remarked mabel hinton who in order to make a record had studied herself into a human skeleton well said molly brown when i left home last september one of my brothers cheerfully informed me that i looked like a rag and a bone and a hank of hair i am afraid i don't feel very saint-like now because i have gained ten pounds and i'm not tired of anything except packing my clothes i'm so sorry to leave blessed old queens that i could kiss her brown cheek if it didn't look foolish well go and kiss the side of the house then put in judy you have a poetic nature molly but i wouldn't have it changed i like it just as it is do you know interrupted margaret wakefield that queens from having once been scorned as a residence has now become a very popular abode and there were so many applications for rooms here for next year that the registrar has had to make a waiting list for the first time in connection with queens think of that at old queens it's because it's the residence of a distinguished person announced molly i think we should put a brass plate on the front door stating that in this house lived a class president who possessed every attribute for the office she was versed in parliamentary law she had an executive mind and she was beloved by all who knew her margaret was pleased at this compliment voyons voyons que vous me flattez she exclaimed it's your warm southern nature that makes you so enthusiastic now the real reason why old brown queens with her moldering vines is so popular all of a sudden is because you are here it was molly's turn now to be pleased we won't argue such a personal matter she said squeezing margaret's hand but i'm glad i'm booked here for next year i was afraid nance would want a singleton she has such a retiring nun-like nature me exclaimed nance disregarding english in her amazement why i've had the happiest wonder of my whole life with you molly if there's a chance for another one like it i'm only too thankful certainly mary carmichael washington brown is a modest soul thought judy who happened to know that her friend had had some five or six tempting offers to move into better quarters the next year at no greater expense to herself one was from mary stewart who was to return next winter for a postgraduate course another was from judith blount who had proposed molly for membership in the beta phi society next year and had furthermore invited the surprised young freshman to take the study of her apartment for a bedroom and offered her the constant use of her sumptuous sitting-room certainly if ever there was an expression of true remorse and repentance that was one molly thought and the allusion to roommates reminded her that she must say good-bye to judith for there would be no time in the morning for last farewells i am going over to the beta phi house for a minute she announced anyone want to come along margaret and jessie who had friends in that abode of fashion as it was called joined her and presently the three white figures were lost in the shadows on the campus she is going to say farewell to black-eyed judith observed judy in a low voice to nance and all i would say is what the colored preacher said can the leopard change his spots nance smiled gravely she did not possess judy's prejudiced nature but her convictions were strong do you think she's a leopard judy she asked she may be a domesticated one said judy of the genus known as cat aren't you ashamed judy exclaimed nance reprovingly but it must be confessed that a few doubts still lurked in her own heart concerning the sincerity of proud judith's repentance in the meantime the three freshmen had separated in the upper hall of the beta phi house and molly had given a timid rap with judith's fine brass knocker instantly the door flew open and she found herself precipitated into a room full of people at least it seemed so at first who had just subsided into quiet because someone was going to play molly was about to retreat in great confusion when miss grace green seized one hand and mary stewart the other judith came forward with a show of extreme cordiality and richard blount left the piano and actually ran the full length of the room exclaiming 
it's miss molly brown of kentucky molly knew she was breaking into a party but there was nothing to do but make a call of a few minutes and then take her leave as gracefully as possible under the circumstances professor edwin green had also shaken her by the hand warmly and pushing up a chair had insisted on her sitting down they had all drawn their chairs around her in a semicircle and richard blount had brought over the piano stool and placed it directly in front of her so that he could look straight at her in fact here sat the little freshman blushing crimson and painfully embarrassed enthroned in a large armchair and gathered around her was a circle of very delightful not to say admiring persons as one of these persons was judith's brother and two were her near cousins molly thought she could explain their excessive cordiality they knew the story of the ring and they were anxious to make amends she recalled with a furtive inner smile the last time she was in those rooms when as a waitress she had upset the coffee on the professor's knees how glad she was that the painful experience was well over and forgotten by now but she was glad about many things that evening she was happy to see that mary and judith had made up their differences and were once more friends she knew that mary who had the kindest heart in the world could never stay angry long i didn't know that judith was giving a party molly began still very much embarrassed i just dropped in to say good-bye because i am leaving tomorrow morning tomorrow morning repeated richard blount wasn't it lucky for me you happened in tonight i had expected to call on you tomorrow afternoon and think how disappointed i should have been to have found the nest empty and the bird flown so you are really off tomorrow broke in professor green i am so sorry i was going to ask you to have tea in the cloisters with my sister and me in the afternoon again molly smiled to herself tea in the cloisters with a distinguished professor and his charming sister only nine months before she had been a lonely shivering little waif of a freshman locked in the cloisters the words of the sophomore croak came back to her they have locked me in the cloisters they have fastened up the gate oh let me out oh let me out it's growing very late i am sorry that my ticket is bought and my berth engaged and the express man coming for my trunk tomorrow at nine she said if all those things were not so i should love to drink soup she stopped and flushed a deep red what absurd trick of the mind had made her say soup i mean tea she went on hastily hoping no one had heard the break miss green was talking with mary stewart richard blount was twirling on the piano stool his hands deep in his pockets and judith was engaged at a side table in pouring lemonade into glasses there was a twinkle of amusement in the professor's brown eyes and he gave molly a delightful smile i must be going she said anxiously rising not till you've had a glass of lemonade for i made it myself said richard gallantly handing her one on a plate molly looked doubtfully toward judith i don't want to be like that young man in the rhyme she said there was a young man so benighted he never knew when he was slighted he'd go to a party and eat just as hearty as if he'd been really invited everybody laughed and judith suddenly becoming a model hostess exclaimed indeed you must stay molly and have some lemonade richard didn't make it at all he only squeezed the lemons molly therefore remained and had a beautiful time and when she really did take her departure the entire party including judith escorted her across the moonlit campus to the door of queens but molly was still certain that it was the ring episode and nothing else that made them all so polite and attentive and so she informed nance and judy that night as she unlocked her trunk for the third time in ten minutes to stuff in some overlooked belonging but judy sniffed the air and exclaimed ring nothing it's popularity molly smiled and went to bed feeling that her last day at wellington had been a decided improvement on the first one the next morning queen's cottage was a pandemonium of trunks and bags and excited young women rushing up and down the halls cries could be heard from every room in the house of the laundress hasn't brought my shirtwaists perfidious woman the express man's here is your trunk strapped i've got to sleep in an upper berth don't forget to write me where are you going to be this summer i can't get this top down and the trunk man's waiting oh dear do hurry we'll miss the bus young ladies the bus is coming called the voice of mrs markham from the front door and then with a fluttering of handkerchiefs and many a last call of good-bye 
the busload of girls moved sedately down the avenue. Molly, looking back at the twin gray towers of Wellington, understood why Frances Andrews wanted so much to return. How glad I am to be only a sophomore, she cried. I shall have three more years at Wellington. End of chapter 23 Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson End of Molly Brown's Freshman Days by Nell Speed